AMB Properties is Quincy's largest apartment rental company with hundreds of units available. They offer short-term and long-term rentals with one up to four bedroom apartments. AMB Properties meets the needs of its tenants with care, compassion, and a quality of service that exceeds expectations. AMB Properties also has a convenient tenant app for you to do your payments or make repair requests. Give them a call today. A and B Properties, 217-919-8080, Quincy. New uh, episode of Frankie Say, Dr. Wollaston. You know, you and I were talking in the green room out, out front. You said that you got here in 2000. You came to Quincy in 2003? About 2003. And uh, what do you have a, what is your, I know what your occupation is, but can you say what your occupation is? Uh, I work in the uh, emergency department of Blessing Hospital as a physician. So in the ER? In the ER, yeah. And how long have you been doing that here in Quincy? Uh, since 2003. So, I mean, doing the math, what is that, 21, 21. 22 years now? Yeah. Yeah. So time has flown by pretty quickly. Yeah. Um, so I kind of want to talk a little bit about some of, like, uh, where you come from, mm-hmm. because I make this... Uh, I make a lot of jokes about like where, where people are from and, and, and how hard it is to get really quality people into Quincy. Okay. So we were talking about the, the very first time that we met and I was having a hard time putting my finger on it. And you were kind of saying, well, I think it was at this place around this time, mm-hmm. maybe before I met my wife, something like that. And I, and evidently I think my wife and your wife are going somewhere with a group of people yeah. this, tonight for right, some right. to that new Mexican restaurant. Yep. What is that? That new Mexican restaurant in Quincy is in the old IHOP. It's in the old IHOP, yeah. and I think it just opened up. I haven't been there, but uh, you know, it looks somewhat interesting. I guess. I mean, I don't even know the name of that place. Are Los they gonna churros? I think it is. Okay. Yeah. So we'll have to. Get so the what load is on it? How the food it's is. their bad group. It's the bad group. The bad group. Uh, I'm not gonna say what that stands for, but uh. no, but BAB. It's an acronym <laughs> for. <laughs> For very smart, intelligent, strong, powerful women that want to go out and do whatever the heck they want to go do. Right. So it's that's a great name. We need a name like that for our group, but we don't have an acronym. Bob. <laughs> <laughs> um, no. Okay. So, um, where are you from? From South Africa originally. Um, born and raised in South Africa. I was. I was born in Johannesburg, 1967. Um, and then raised there till I was about 16. And then when I was 16, came to the States. I actually moved to Dallas where my mom was from. So my mom was from the States. Um, so I had that American heritage and then I had the South African heritage as well. So tell me about the South African heritage. So this is a place where I want to go visit. You mm-hmm. know the, the great Charles Whitcomb? Yes, um, he's famous all over town. He is famous all over town for lots of reasons. <laughs> and uh, he's a character, a uh, very smart man, he very, is. very good man. Yeah. And uh, one of my favorite people. Yeah. So he's from, he's from South Africa. Yes. Is he from the same? He's from area? a town close by called Pretoria, which was the actual capital back in the day. Johannesburg was more the commercial center. I was from Johannesburg, so probably an hour apart. Um, his location or his city's more Afrikaans, and then Johannesburg's probably more English if you had to qualify it. Um, so the two major nationalities there, of course, you know, you've got your indigenous people, and then you've got the um, you know, the English-speaking South, uh, white South Africans and the uh, Afrikaans-speaking white South Africans. So they were the immigrants back in, you know, the 1600s and then in the 1800s. There were two waves of um, people that came over. So in Johannesburg, Johannesburg, am I saying that right? Right. That, what is that like? So what's that like growing up? And is that a big city? It's a very big city. Yeah. I mean, are we talking millions of people? Yeah, now it is. Absolutely. It's probably 10 million people, I think, at this point. 10? Yeah. The greater Johannesburg region is very big. Okay. So yeah. bigger than Chicago? I would say so. Yeah. Holy moly. Yeah. And did you live in the city? Kind of lived in the suburbs. I mean, it, you know, when you think of South Africa, you, you know, and I've been asked this question the whole time, and I think people are more attuned to what it really is like these days than they used to be, but they honestly thought I was from the jungle. I mean, it wasn't like that at all. I wish I could say it was, because I think that would have <laughs> been an exciting upbringing. <laughs> It was more, I mean, there were definitely those options or opportunities to go into the bush and to see wildlife and to experience the true African continent. But in general, it's just a big commercial, industrialized, very fast paced, energetic city. And uh, it was a lot of fun. I mean, I grew up, you know, going to a good school, playing a lot of sports. And, uh, 
you know, a lot of extracurricular activity. So we had a good time. What was, what was it like living there? I mean, how does it differ from like um, a big city in America or, I mean, I'm sure it's a lot different than Quincy. I mean, is it, is it terribly different? So, so I'm asking these questions. I sound yeah. so ignorant. Well, I mean, you got to remember, we grew up in the era of apartheid, you know, so everybody knows what apartheid is. Um, it's basically a separation uh, enforced by the government of the races. And so uh, things were very different as a result of that. But of course I was unaware of it. I grew up in that structure and I wasn't aware that there was really anything different. Um, you know, there were always rumors and, um, clash is sort of at the, you know, in the fringes of your consciousness, but nothing ever directly affected you. I mean, there were a few major incidents like the uh, 1976 Soweto riots that got everybody's attention. Uh, but in general, it was just something that you lived in or lived with, but weren't really aware of its consequences. And that was, looking back on it now, I think that was the most, the weirdest part about the whole thing. Um, but otherwise, it was, it was like growing up here um, uh, in, in the early 80s without the technology, the social media, and everything else we have. No TV. We didn't have TV until I was probably 12 years old. So, I mean, definitely grew up in um, a very, uh, relatively speaking, antiquated type uh, so, structure. So you're saying, so growing up in South Africa, growing up in Johannesburg, mm -hmm. are you saying that one of the weirdest things to you is all of these things are happening? And you said on the fringes of your con of your consciousness, meaning right. there's a lot of huge things that are happening in the area. But so let's be honest. Before, like you're 20 years old, 25 year years old nowadays. A lot of kids. Can you call people kids up until 25? I you mean, can you probably shouldn't? Shouldn't? I mean, really, 15 should be the cutoff. I think. <laughs> you would think in Johannesburg. 25 is getting in a lot of leeway. I think. Oh, I I think so too. Yeah. But you know, but um. What are some of the things, so you mentioned some kind of like riots that were right. happening. Right. Were you conscious of any of that kind of stuff that was happening? A little bit. I mean, my mom was somewhat socially active, so uh, there would be weird interactions with police um, that would come by the house and, you know, demand to talk to her, or, um, some of her friends, and there were these weird secret societies that I never really knew, you know, what was going on or what was involved, I think. My mom and dad were a little bit on the, uh, a little bit involved with that and trying to, you know, get, uh, or, or trying to uh, push for equality for everybody. Basically, that was the bottom line. And they had this, this thing called a pass law where you had to have a, a very, uh, if you were a black person from the, from the, um, from the uh, settlements, um, from the townships, then you had to have a pass. It was almost like a passport to come into those white areas. And the police could go around and ask anybody randomly to show their pass. And, uh, if you didn't have a pass, they could arrest you. So they'd come to the door sometimes and knock on the door and ask to see the, you know, the maid's pass. And if they didn't have it, they'd arrest that person. You know, so you got to see things like that, and uh, that was always a little bit bizarre, a little jarring. But in general, you just went about your daily life and didn't pay too much attention. I mean, you know, you were a kid growing up. That's all you knew. You know. Did you? Ha so have you learned more about things after you left? I mean, you left, did, did you learn more after you had left that area as opposed to being in it? So for example, when I was in school, they would teach about the Revolutionary War. Clearly I was not around for that, mm -hmm. but they would teach it and you had to, you had to like, here, here in America, you would learn about the Revolutionary War. You would learn about things like, okay, when was, the, when was Jamestown founded? And I still remember 1609. I hope that's the right, I hope that's the right year. But I'm saying, <laughs> you learn about those things <clears throat> and you learn it through rote memory. Mm -hmm. And later on, as an adult, I go back and read books. I'm like, oh, now I understand the Revolutionary War. Mm -hmm. You know, or you hear, or you read, you learn about things that are happening. Um, so for example, if in 1989, I, 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 I remember Reagan, I was born during the Ford administration the day after, I think Jimmy Carter got elected or got inaugurated okay. the day after I was born. Yeah. Okay, so I don't remember any of Carter's time. Right. Right. How would I? I'm four years old. Yeah. And then Reagan came along and I remember seeing the president on the television and my parents loved Ronald Reagan. Okay. And he was, and we, everyone had to be quiet, but I'm hearing the president speak and I have no idea what he's saying because I'm a young child. I have to, if I want to learn about what was happening during my life, I would have to study about it. I'd have to study it now. I'd have to go back and look at what, about what's happening, like mm -hmm. the Berlin Wall falling. Mm -hmm. When like Putin invading Ukraine, 
when I have, I remember being alive and not having any idea about what was going on in, in 1992. I have to learn about that now. So what I'm asking right. you is, so when you were living in South Africa, so being a 16 year old kid, 14, 15, 16, were you able to, to learn anything about what was going on at that time or are you learning it now? I think, you know, the learning was somewhat structured and, and limited. We were exposed because I went to a fairly progressive school to very influential people. I remember we had Desmond Tutu come and talk at our school, who was a big um, civil rights activist in South Africa at the time. And that just wasn't really heard of at most places. For instance, I can almost guarantee at Charles Whitcomb School that wouldn't have happened. But uh, so we, we, did, we were exposed to some progressive ideas. And of course, when you're growing up and, you, and you're learning about something, it's not really learning. You're just experiencing life and just doing. It's later on when you go back and you reexamine the past and you try to learn about it. That's when you really learn about things and how they went down. And I think that's the fascinating part about it is to be able to go back and correlate your own experiences with what really happened and realize that there was a whole lot more going on than what you're even aware of. And was that's there, what's so amazing, so fascinating. You know? Yeah, because, I mean, after the fact... Yeah as you get older, you know, getting thrown into things as young people, I guess young people don't, they might be living it, they may be experiencing it, but that does not mean that they understand it. No, and I think young people are also very self-centered and selfish, and that's just the way you are, that's just your nature, you're more concerned about yourself as an individual than you are about society as a whole. I think you develop empathy and societal concerns as you get older, and then that's when you start looking at the broader picture and, you know, understanding somebody else's point of view. I think that's how it works. How old were you when you fully gained empathy because you're a pretty empathetic person well i try to be i try to see everybody's point of view well you do see a lot of people's point of view there's yeah. this i gotta tell i gotta tell you so you know we're not going to talk politics right now but i will tell you this i've noticed one thing about you so this is so interesting to have like you're an er doctor you're an emergency room physician at blessing mm -hmm. and quincy is pretty lucky to have a person like you um you're pretty worldly. How often do you get back to South Africa? I'll probably go back about once every other year or so. And you know, a, a person like you, being an ER physician, that person has to have some level of empathy, I think, to make as big of an impact as you do. So I have, do you know, do you, get, do you hand out customer satisfaction surveys after? Because <laughs> there have been more, I, I think there's been, uh, one of the reasons why you're on this pod is because of the kind of the overwhelming like good things that you have done for people mm -hmm. in the ER. Um, I guess there's some ER physicians maybe that don't have empathy. They're just there. They're on a contract. Like someone's coming in. There's something wrong. Mm -hmm. They're in a lot of pain. The ER doctor's like, okay, yeah. I mean, I see what's happening, and you can, you know, they know all of the technical terms and they know the technical medicine of it. And it's boom, 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 stitch this, 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 here's mm. the meds mm. out. Yeah. But I don't, I don't get the impression that you're really like that. No, I mean, everybody has bad days and good days. I mean, I think, you know, you could get a physician who just came out of a traumatic pediatric arrest, you know, and he's in a bad mood as a result of that. And so, you know, th there's going to be variations in how somebody behaves on a, an hourly hour or day-to-day -day basis. But I think in general, you know, I've lasted in this job for almost 30 years now. I think you have to have some level of, of empathy and concern and, and caring for people. Otherwise, you wouldn't be able to do it. It's just, it's sort of a process of natural selection, I think. You know, and to be able to stay at a place and, and survive and, and thrive at a place, I think you have to have certain qualities that the organization appreciates. And I hope that that's the way it's been. So, so um, one of the... I was talking with my wife, and I don't know if she was talking with your wife, Jill, or, or somebody, and they said, uh, do you know what Anthony Wallison is doing right, right right now? He's like training for something. So in the green room, I go, what are you gonna do after this? And mm -hmm. you said, either go ride, go ride a bike or go play some chess. Right. So these are things that... <laughs> So uh, I, I thought both of those answers, whichever you decide, I'm sure it'll be great. You, you're, you're the kind of person you- Well, I could do both, actually. I was thinking about doing both. So you're pretty fit. Yeah. And uh, like really, really fit. Um, are you training for anything right now or have you gone through any, uh, what kind of- uh, I always tell people, you know, people ask me if I'm training for anything. I just tell them I'm training for life because 
at any moment in time, if I want to be able to go do something with the kids or go do some crazy hike or whatever, I want to be ready to go. I don't want to have to say, okay, well, I've got six months to prepare for a hike up Kilimanjaro. If somebody says, let's go tomorrow, I'll say, okay, fine, let's go tomorrow. You know, so I keep myself prepared and ready to go at any time. That's the way I look at it. And plus, it's fun. I enjoy it. It's, it's you know, if I, if I got out of shape, I'd feel awfully burdensome. I wouldn't like that at all. So when you say, you know, go and climb Mount Kilimanjaro, you're not kidding. No, I mean, it's, Mount Kilimanjaro is, from what I understand, I've not done it. It's not like hiking Everest. It's just a long slog. But it, it takes, uh, you know, some physical attributes. You have to be able to hike three days straight for eight hours a day, whatever it is, and get to a certain amount of altitude. So it's not technical, but it is physically demanding. So anything physically demanding I'm up for, if you ask me to go, you know, ice climb, the, you know, the north face of the Eiger, I'm not going to do that. I don't have the technical skills. <laughs> and I'm horribly afraid of heights, so that's not going to work. But, yeah, anything physical i mean you know i like ultra running i like adventure racing uh you know kiteboarding so you know those sort of fringe sports kind of excite me do you think um so what did you say kiteboarding kiteboarding yeah. so give me the list of the things that you do like physically because this is something that uh, it's not always a tone in some of like the frank you say podcasts mm-hmm. but this there's there's a I hope that there's a certain level of energy of, or inspiration. I usually have pretty fun guests. They're either they're either very they're lively or they're smart or they're fun or they've done something or they're just fun. To, they're just good to talk to because they're good people. Yeah. Um, so, have you ever run a marathon? Yeah, I've probably done fifteen to twenty marathons. You've run fifteen or twenty? Yeah, I I, I don't know exactly the number because um, you've run so many that you don't keep track of your marathons. <laughs> right, and some horrible ones too. I mean, <laughs> no, I mean, you know, when you, if you run a marathon or one or two or three, um, you can remember. But uh, I mean, unless you've got your medals on a wall, your t-shirts, whatever, you're not going to remember how many you've run. I mean, I've probably yeah, fifteen or twenty at least. Probably oh. done Chicago five times. It's it's the bigger stuff that always gets your attention. So, um, I did a thirty-five miler in South Africa in Cape Town that was interesting, and then I did a fifty-two miler in uh, Wyoming. Uh, a couple of years ago in the Bighorn Mountains that almost killed me. So that was that was probably the biggest thing I've done physically. It almost killed you? Yeah. I mean, I wasn't, I don't think I was properly trained for it. I mean, I'd be doing a few races here and there, but I mean, not the huge distances required to run that distance in a day, you know. So we were also talking about elevation change. So you're going up and down, and the total elevation change, I think, was around 14,000 feet. So um, that was a big day. That was a big day. How long did that take? Uh, it took around 12 hours. Yeah, okay. Yeah. You ran for 12 hours? So but, you know, honestly, I, it's, it's becoming less and less. Um, it's becoming more and more common to do these things. I mean, you go to a lot of these ultras. It used to be a very exclusive group of people. Now, I mean, there's a lot of people doing these things. 50 miles are not uncommon anymore. I mean, people doing 100 miles, 150 miles, 200 miles. So 50 miles is not. It depends on, you know, what you correlate it to. I mean, you, you're, you know, who you're relating to, what kind of group you're, you're in. If you're in Boulder, 50 miles is like nothing. It's like a like a regular marathon distance you know i think in quincy it probably gets people's attention <laughs> <laughs> i've heard you say that before yeah um so what other things besides uh so cycling any uh bike riding yeah a lot of biking um what kind of so things? road biking mountain biking um some friends of ours uh and i are going to do a trip from punta gorda to key west coming up this year that's going to be a lot of fun Okay. So um, some guy arranged for us to do a, a seven night, uh, you know, 50, 60 mile a day kind of thing. So really relaxed, easy riding. And it's not hard to ride 60 miles a day. And it sounds like a long distance, but it really isn't. I mean, if you can ride 15 miles an hour, you can finish that in, you know, five, six hours. So um, very doable. Um, but yeah, generally when we go and we ride with the group, we go anywhere from 30 to 40 miles. There's a bike club in Quincy here that I ride a lot with. And there's a bike club down in Florida that I ride a lot with. So every chance I get, I'm out on the road riding the bike, but I mix it up. I don't, do one thing. I like to run. I like to lift, you know, so usually I'll rotate through lift, bike, run, lift, bike, run kind of thing. And then if there's some activity going on, then that sort of replaces the workout for the day kind of thing. So, uh, so riding a bike from Punta Gorda down to Key West. So obviously you've got to go through all of the keys and, yeah. uh, and I've, I've, I've driven the, I've driven from Miami to Key West and there's that one road. It's, I guess it's a highway. Is, yeah. it, is it a two lane or a four lane when you go down through the it's, keys? It's pretty narrow in most parts, and I think some of it is two lane, and it does get a little hairy. But, uh, you know, 
that's that's part of the challenge of the thing. So what are they staying gonna, alive? <laughs> so what are they going to do? Where's the bike lane? Well, you just you're off on the shoulder. Okay. And really, a bike does have the right of way on a road. I mean, cars need to realize that. So you're, I mean, you are, um, you have the right to ride on the road. You have to follow the same rules of the road as everybody else does. But you know, if you're on a road bike, that doesn't mean you have to ride on the shoulder. You can ride in the lane. People, cars have to go by you, give you six feet, and you know, honestly, it doesn't happen very often. We get people. You know, unfortunately, you know, even here or down, you know, wherever it is in Florida, they'll get as close to you as they can just to try to scare you or knock you off the road. They'll have people throw things at you. I mean, I've had all sorts of crazy stuff happen on bikes. I had a guy come up on a motorcycle one time and try to grab my rear wheel and uh, flip me off the bike, but I managed to kind of get out of the way. So, I mean, it's, it's kind of crazy out there, to be honest. Why are people on four wheels so angry at the people on two wheels? I'm serious. This I is think like a lot a of I think a lot of times they feel guilt, like maybe you know they're the <laughs> ones who should be out there doing something instead of sitting on their rears in a, in a, you know a big fancy truck. Um, I mean, honestly, you know, slowing down, giving a biker six feet, and then slow going around, and when the when it's appropriate, when there's not an oncoming car coming where you're going to get knocked off the road, you know, what is it? it lo- you lose 15 seconds of your commute time. It's not a big deal. People just need to be more respectful. I think it's it's. Uh, it's amazing how often people get hit, you know, riding bikes. And a friend of mine just got hit down in Florida, actually. He was out on a bike, and he's a, a GI doctor, broke his ribs, and he ended up with small brain bleed and everything else. But it's just, you know, just like with motorcycles. I mean, motorcycles have the same issues. They're just a lot louder and a lot bigger and a lot faster, maybe more noticeable. Um, and to some people, maybe less irritating. But, you know, guys on a bike and spandex, maybe that bothers people. I don't know. You know. Well, I mean, yeah, <laughs> like the respect issue. It's like, okay, if you're going to – if your bike's bigger and it's got an engine, maybe I think the people who don't ride bicycles, I think they respect the motorcycle more because it's bigger, louder, stronger, fa- faster, but really they should respect the, the cyclist more because that person's putting out more effort. And Well, I like to think so, but really everybody on the road should be respected. It shouldn't, you yeah. shouldn't be playing games of chicken on the road with big trucks and oncoming traffic and everything else. It's just not worth it, you know? And uh, so, I mean, cyclists get, you know, killed, not all the time, but it's, unfortunately, it happens with some alarming frequency. So uh, it's just a, my little PSA that I'd like to get out there that you know, people should be more respectful. And that goes for any form of traffic, whether you're walking down the road or motor, on a motorcycle, whatever you're in, a smaller car, you know, it doesn't matter, electric vehicle, you know, God forbid. <laughs> <laughs> so do I have you confused? So obviously Charles, our friend Charles, which by the way, the reason why we're bringing up Charles Whitcomb is if, if you don't know Charles Whitcomb, you got to get to know this guy. I think he finally did, not finally, but I mean, um, the guy works pretty hard. And uh, did he, did his, did, did he, is his business, did he retire from that business recently? I know that he was he has, um, yeah. at BowPro. He was at BowPro, and I think he was trying to sell it, and I think the store is still for sale, and I think it would be a great business for somebody. But he's now officially retired and traveling around the country in the RV, and we'll see how long that lasts. Yeah. But I'm sure he'll find something to dig his toes into fairly shortly. Yeah, he goes nonstop. Yeah. So I know that he um, is a very avid hunter. Yeah. Now, do you do any of that? I do. It took some cajoling and... Uh, you know, I had land here in Quincy for a long time. I never hunted it. I had a property out of Fort Creek. I never hunted. And then I had another property at Silent Springs that I sold um, because the kids were going off to college. And all of a sudden, I wanted to hunt. And now I had no land. So uh, Charles and I now are part of a hunting group. And we lease land. And uh, so I do that. But uh, my next deer is going to be awfully expensive. It's probably going to be about a $6,000 deer because I haven't gotten deer the last two years. So <laughs> with the cost of the hunting lease... <laughs> And uh, the number of deer I, I managed to harvest, it's, it's, it doesn't pay off very well. So. so I had to convince my wife that I needed to be part of this hunting club again. So. But it's, it's fun just to get out there. I like getting out there and sitting in the stand and watching the wildlife. And it's very meditative. Have you, have you gone and hunted in Africa? I haven't. Charles wants to take us over there and go on a hunting trip. I prefer to go over there and just watch the animals myself. I don't have a problem with people hunting the animals. To me, I just enjoy being in nature and being, you know, with the animals, so, so to speak. You're taking, like, the St. Francis of the Seasy approach. <laughs> You're not trying to kill I'm more them. of a pacifist, yeah. To me, it's very hard for me to kill an animal. I understand it needs to be done. Um, you know, we eat dead animals all day long, but, uh, you know, there's something very personal about killing an animal. Some people don't seem to care. Uh, some people care, but uh, it's a form of respect to the animal and the, and the 
the animal probably doesn't understand the difference, and really being killed by a bow and arrow is probably no less significant than being jumped on by a lion. You know, I mean, which would you rather have? You know, you've got to die somehow in the bush, so. Um, you know, to me, it's a horrific way to go, but for the animal, it's probably a blessing. I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. So, yeah, <laughs> that, that's a good point. You know, the Native Americans, the, the, when they would go and, and kill a buffalo, sometimes they would cry. I mean, they would be so thankful. They yeah. would apologize. They would. They had some sort of harmony and respect. They, they viewed the animal as, as a kindred spirit. You know, so humans weren't any different from animals. It was just a necessary fact of their life. They had to kill that animal, but at the same time, they show respect and they perform a ritual, whatever it is, and that soul passes on to their afterlife. Um, so, I mean, in that sense, they, they realized the integrity and the respect of that individual animal. I think a lot of people who hunt today maybe just hunt irresponsibly or, or not, you know, unsocially conscious of what they're doing. Um, I think you should, you should always respect what you're trying to kill. You know, yeah, do you th I think that goes for human beings too. <laughs> do you think do you think humans are too far removed from the food they're eating? So I know people who have never hunted an animal, mm. never planted a seed, never grown a garden, mm. never cleaned an animal, never chopped it up. I mean yeah. the only thing these humans know is they go to a job. They get money. They go give the money. They never meet the people who are actually making their food. Mm -hmm. they, no, they don't even ever come into contact. You know, it's like city folk. Like, I mean, I don't know. I'm probably closer to one of those kinds of people. I don't think that's a comp. I'm not giving myself a compliment here, yeah. I think. I'm not saying I've never, you know, I've never plowed a field. Right. I've had a garden. Right. And I've actually never, um, killed an animal to eat although i think it's necessary as part of like a rite of passage as a man mm -hmm. and i'm not saying if you're a man you don't do it you're not a man i'm not saying that i'm saying for my code right for my code it's on my list of things that frank li listen before you become worm food you have to go out there and track down an animal you know become one with nature the universe and say hey animals i'm coming out here for you <laughs> and you go out there yeah you know, like shoot like shooting a deer okay yeah. so if we don't if we don't shoot the deer the deer are going to overpopulate am i right they're going to is this a theory no i mean I th it's all well i think it's it's a balance right i mean you've got habitat which of course is a is a big issue and then you've got um you know, predation from the natural predators which really isn't even a factor anymore i don't think there are no natural predators anymore as far as deer go unless you're in Yellowstone or something, but around right. here there aren't, there aren't any uh, significant wolf populations or bear right. populations. So yeah, the deer, need to, the population definitely needs to be controlled. Um, but uh, that's because deer have a lot of habitat. There's a lot of species that don't survive because they just simply don't have any habitat. It's not as if they're being hunted to, uh, to extinction. They just don't have any place to live. So. Because maybe humans are going in there and destroying their, their habitat or, or destroying the ecology. Absolutely. I mean, without a doubt. I mean, the, the number of ecosystems that... Uh, you know, falling to pieces is, is truly remarkable. I mean, I think we're in the, in the middle of a, what, a third grade extinction event, and I think yes. most of it's, uh, you know, human driven, unfortunately, but I don't see any other way around it. I mean, human beings as a society is just advancing so quickly and, and so technologically minded that they've lost touch with the natural world. I mean, we as a society have lost touch with the natural world, so we don't live with nature anymore. I mean, there are some people who do, who understand it, who are there, who are, you know, can, can empathize with it, but uh, most of us, I think, we live in a completely um, uh, a completely different uh, realm from, from where our ancestors came from. Yeah, I mean, the Industrial Revolution completely changed, I would argue, maybe even possibly changed our DNA to a point. Mm -hmm. There's a book called uh, Homo sapiens sapiens. There's this idea that humans moved, you know, that moved from maybe Australopithecus and Neanderthal or, like, or Homo erectus, and I don't know the exact order. Mm -hmm but moving into homo sapien and then with the industrial revolution through nature and nurture we actually added an, the genus went or i'm sorry so the genus species the, the genus still is still homo and then the species went from sapien to sapien sapiens mm -hmm. and i don't know all the details on this but the idea of it is is um our muscle masses are getting smaller because we're not 
carrying physical loads. Our brains are probably getting bigger mm -hmm. because we're trying to data collect. Um, our, our, our fast twitch fibers in our hands are getting faster, mm -hmm. but we are getting, um, there's just, just changes happening to humans. So changes as a direct result of industrialization in the last hundred years. In other words, if you took a person from today and you put him back, let's say a thousand, two thousand years ago, as opposed to having advanced or natural selected for a better human, this person from today would not survive as well as the one from 2,000 years ago. Because the one today has evolved, like you said, it's evolved along with industry, it's evolved along with technology. So as far as a, you know, an animal species, I think we've degraded our function. I mean, you're not gonna be able to hunt and run and fight like, you know, Homo erectus or, or Homo sapiens, for instance. But they're not gonna be able to compute and do physics and you know live in this technologically advanced society that we do and part of it is being for our own protection i mean the fight or flight response developed you know as a result of predation out in the wild and now you've got cars and traffic and unless you can control that response you end up with stress and chronic anxiety and depression and i think a lot of, a lot of what we deal with today as human beings is a result of that we weren't we haven't adapted fast enough to keep up with technological change right and so we're still suffering the the basic stress responses that are that our ancestors did just in a completely different society. Yeah, we're, we're possibly not stuck, but this is a transition phase between the old and the new, and the bridge essentially has been this 100, 150 years of, mm -hmm. of industrialization. Mm -hmm. What do you think, have you heard of the, the, uh, the theory that, have you ever seen the, like the pictures of the prototypical or stereotypical aliens with the big heads and the really big eyes and the real small mouths. Yeah. And the ears are getting smaller and and they're just they look they look like wimpy like spaghetti arms, <laughs> but they got the big heads. Yeah. Have you seen these pictures? Sure. Okay. There's a theory out there that says that those are us in the future. Mm -hmm. Because so smaller mouths, smaller chins, mm -hmm. cuz so so doctor, what's this what's the jaw called? Is it the the, well, you've it, got your master. Are you talking about your master muscles and your facial yeah. structure? Yeah, your mandible. The mandible. Mm. All right. So the idea of, of of we cook our food. There's so much processed food. It's very it's very easy to chew. Sure. We didn't have to rip, you know, meat off of a bone. Mm. We don't have to meet. I mean, you know, some people. I mean, there's kids right now that won't eat meat off a bone. Yeah, your wisdom teeth. They were there for grinding and chewing on corn yeah. and grains and things. You don't need those anymore. They yank those out. So. They yank them out. Yeah. Because you don't need them. But then I guess the eyes are maybe getting bigger and wider set. The ears are getting smaller mm. because maybe in two or 300, 500 years, the ears will be very, very small because everyone's wearing headphones. Yeah. I mean, I don't know. It's just, I mean. Or you're communicating via a neural link or whatever it is. You don't yeah. need to communicate with a silly mouth structure or larynx. You know, the brains are just communicating directly with each other. So all these accessory organs aren't even necessary. You know? Yeah. <laughs> so man, fascinating. So <laughs> if you're not gonna, so after you ride your bike tonight, you might go play chess and where, so chess is kind of an interesting thing. Do you mind talking about chess? Because yeah, I'm not a great chess, but I'd say <laughs> mediocre to average. Um, yeah. But uh, yeah. there's a, there's a little how come group. I can't beat you? <laughs> <Okay. laughs> well, you need to come play a little more often. I know. But there's the Quincy Area Chess Club, the Quack. So we have a little acronym for that, Quack, Quincy Area Chess Club. Because a lot. With a K. So with a K, because a lot, with a K. A lot of a lot of guys in there are doctors. Yeah, um, but uh, also, you know, other folks as well. So, I mean, and anybody can play male field. We have some, you know, unfortunately we have a high schooler who plays occasionally that can play five of us simultaneously. And he, he challenged somebody who played them blindfolded the other night and they refused because he probably would have beaten them blindfolded. But he's just this incredibly. Can we say who it is or no? Um, it's it's one of the Song Dong Kong kids. It is one of the Song Dong Kongs yeah. kids. Yeah. Is it? Uh, it's incredibly bright. Yeah, he can play five of you at the same time. Yeah, and, and beat us easily. So, um, and I don't even think he plays that much. He, but he is, I think he, he does play with the, or he, there's a team at uh, Quincy High that he plays on. So, um, but I mean, he's just a natural brain, obviously. I mean, you're, you, no matter how much you play or practice, you'll never play at his level. That's, that's the difference. Yeah, so yeah, <laughs> Quincy has a high school kid that is so good, he can play multiple. By the way, you're a good chess player. Um, I mean, obviously, I'm not that good of a chess player, but every time I play somebody 
in that chess club. I've, I've only played like three or four of you guys, mm-hmm. and it's always a big L. I take a loss every time. <laughs> but then when I play my kids, I beat them in like six moves. So, you know, I, I, I open with That'll the change Queen's. Quickly, I'm sure. I hope so. Yeah. I open up with, with the Queen's Gambit, and all of a sudden, <laughs> you know, four or five moves, it, the game's over. But um, you know what's really interesting about chess? Is in terms of board games, I can't think of a board game that I like more than chess. If I could only keep, if I could only keep one game, because mm-hmm. I used to be like, when I was a kid, I played a lot of board games. Okay, so and I don't know if this is an American thing. You tell me, you, you tell me. Don't be afraid to tell me how ignorant I am. But you know, we start with the chutes and ladders, and then you work your way up to Monopoly, and then you work you work you work your way up to all of these other board games like the game of life and mm-hmm. you can play Scrabble and all, all of these things. But I noticed that people who play chess as a young person, they just matriculate their path. is different mm-hmm. and I don't know what it is. So two out of my three kids play chess. The four year old does not play chess um, because she cannot, she refuses to learn the game. She just does mm. not want. She doesn't want to know where the rook moves, the bishop, the knight. She doesn't. <laughs> she's four. She still has. She's four. She's four. Yeah. But my seven-year-old yeah. can play without a problem, yeah. and my nine-year-old can play w- without a problem. So you've got three kids. Three. Yeah. Do any of them play chess? They do, although reluctantly. Yeah, I don't know why that is. Some people just take to the game, and then, you know. But I think part of it is anything you try to encourage your kids to do or force them to do. They tend to back off and want to do something else. <laughs> you know, and, and sometimes, you know, you'll do stuff with them that they, they get excited about, but it's not going to be everything you like to do. Your kids don't necessarily like to do everything you like to do. And some, it takes some getting used to. And it, just acceptance, I think, after a while. Yeah, you've got good kids. Yeah. Um, I don't know all of them personally or anything like that, but um, you seem to have done, you and your wife have seemed to have done a really, really, really good job. Yeah, they told me, whatever you do when you come on this podcast, whatever you do, don't shame the family. So I'm trying not to shame the family. So. Oh, you have an amazing family. <laughs> I think anybody that, that doesn't know your family, they, they should get to know. You know, your wife is a totally amazing woman. Mm. So my wife, your wife is kind of a, uh, my wife kind of has your wife up on a pedestal a bit. Um, and for, for, for a good reason. She's wicked smart. She's beautiful. She's funny. She's, she can talk to anybody. She's super nice. Mm-hmm. She's extremely pleasant to everybody. Um, good sense of humor, all that stuff. And uh, yeah, they'll be at the BAP group here um, any minute. What kind of, um, what kind of uh, in your profession, um, what drove you to be a doctor? I wasn't very good at accounting, that's the issue. <laughs> <laughs> did you try accounting? I did try accounting, and my daughter's an accountant now. So, uh, but it was my first C I got in college, and so I started looking at other options, and I realized I was good at science. And my grandfather had been a, a physician in Africa, and uh, his stories were always fascinating. So I think in my, in the back of my mind, I always felt that you know that was a possibility, but I never really had, you know, a hundred percent commitment to the idea until probably sophomore year of college, and I was like, well, you know, I don't think business is going to work out for me. Uh, didn't come from a lot of money, so I had to sort of go into something that, you know, I, I was able to use my smarts, my scientific background, you know, to, to build my career, and uh, medicine just was a natural fit for me. I mean, was it, so what happened? You were in college and took a, like a, some kind of course that sort of You basically just, you, you, d- you take uh, biology courses. Biology was very interesting, of course, um, and uh, anthropology I thought was fascinating, and then you know, even chemistry and physics was, was fun up to a point. Um, so you find something you're good at and you just naturally, you know, segue into that career path. And so once you've achieved your pre-meds, then you take what's called the MCAT. And if you do well on that, and it's a lot easier now than it used to be, is my understanding. Once you take that, then you get into medical school. And are they making it easier? I think they've, they've made it harder. It's a lot more challenging. I think just oh, in general is, things are harder and more challenging. Oh, the MCAT is more challenging now. I think the score required to get into medical school is a lot more challenging. Oh. But maybe I'm just imagining things. It just seems to me, it's just, it seems a lot more competitive today than it did back, back in the 80s and 90s. Where'd you go to school? Which one? Yeah. So take, <laughs> take, take me through it. There's well, been a lot of schools. So let's start with this progressive school that you were talking about. You went to a progressive high school? Progressive as in they were less, um, uh, you know, indoctrinated or less inclined to indoctrinate 
try to teach you being a little more free thinking. So it was a school in South Africa. Um, I have to put a plug in because it was the same school that Dave Matthews went to, and he was in my class, as a matter of fact. So Dave Matthews? I'll put that out there. You know, Dave Matthews class? is Dave Matthews' band. So he was actually in my class in South Africa. So all sorts of crazy people came out of the school. And now he was from the States, moved to South Africa, and I met him uh, sophomore year. And so I knew him for a couple of years before I came. Well, not sophomore year, I'd say freshman year. And then knew him for a couple of years before I came back to the United States. And then he stayed on, and then he ended up doing whatever he did. Um, but I didn't even know he was, he was the same guy until relatively recently. And somebody pointed it out to me that he had gone to my school. And I said, well, I knew Dave Matthews, but it can't be the same guy. <laughs> so then I went back and looked at it, and sure enough, it was the same. What, where were you? <laughs> were you out and about? Who, who told I was on you? a run. I was running uh, the St. Louis Half Marathon, and I was running with a guy who recognized my accent, asked me where I was from, and asked me what year I graduated, what school I went to. And he was obviously a huge Dave Matthews fan because he knew what year he graduated, what school he went to, and he said, well, you must know this guy. And I said, no, I mean, I knew Ma Dave Matthews, but it's obviously not the same person. But then I went and fact-checked it like a good journalist would do. But, and... Uh, same guy. Jeez. Isn't that weird? So, okay, so if you went to a Dave Matthews concert yeah. and you saw him and you went backstage and say, hey, I just want to say hi to you. Do you remember me? Would, do you think he would? Well, I think he would at this point because he's on our WhatsApp group from that school of 85. Um, so there is some communication there. So, yeah, I mean, I wouldn't say I'd know him very well. I mean, would he recognize me in, you know, out of the blue? Probably not. I'd have to reintroduce myself. But... Um, it is interesting to, to have him in this group, to have him on this feed and, you know, comment every now and then on various things. So it, it, it's interesting. interesting. Yeah. Interesting. So, so from this progressive school, high school, um, so you're 16 when you left South Africa, right? Came to the States, came to the States and went to a school in Dallas called Highland Park High School. Um, claim to fame right now, I'd say Scotty Shuffer, PGA Tour. He's from Highland Park High School. Okay. Um, but a very, a very rich area of Dallas, probably one of the top 10, you know, wealthiest zip codes in the U.S. And so I was not quite prepared for that. It was, it was more segregated in that school than it was in my school in South Africa. Hmm. I mean, I think there was one black kid in the whole school. And this is, you know, this is coming to the United States, which is a, an integrated country. So to me, you know, the exposure to different people, different races, different types of people was less when I came to the States for two years in high school. I'm not saying it was a bad school. It's just that's the way the neighborhood, and the, you know, set up. And uh, so that was interesting um, and just a completely different culture and, and certainly massive culture shock when I first arrived. I, I can't explain it. I mean, there's just so many little things. I mean, just, you know, accents, not being able to understand what people are saying and just adjusting to that, you know, on a daily life. And plus you're 16 years old and, you know, did you enjoy the raging hormone factor? It was it was rough, you know, but uh, it, it, so it, it, so I would say it was it was difficult. But at the same time, it was also a very exciting time period. It was also a very dangerous time period, I think, because, you know, I mean, you need a lot of stability, I think, at that age, and uh, you know you can go off on a tangent very easily if you're not careful. So this high, so from the high school in Dallas, um, you went to college somewhere. Where, well, we where ended up know? staying in Dallas, and uh, wasn't even going to go to college, and my grandmother sort of insisted on it, and she said, "Well, why don't you go to SMU?" Because your grandfather went there, and mm. so as a legacy, um, and that was the only school I applied to was SMU, so Southern Methodist University in Dallas, and I ended up going there, and then. Unfortunately, SMU got the death penalty that, that year we started. Um, How so? So I don't know if you remember when they were paying their players and the, and the Pony Express was all the rage and Eric Dickerson was playing um, for SMU oh. and uh, winning the national championship. So SMU was okay, a yeah. big football power. Yes. And then the NCAA came down and, and handed SMU a death penalty, basically no football for four years, killed the program. Um, okay. And we were part of the Southwest Conference with Texas, Oklahoma, and everybody else. And uh, – so that really changed life on campus. But for me, I played rugby. So we, uh, I mean, I had a great um, group of guys that we hung out with and uh, had the Wall Street Journal interview me because we were the only contact sport left on campus. I got a little article from the Wall Street Journal, you know, okay. talking about the only contact sport on campus. So that was kind of fun. So then from SMU to, uh, um, you know, University of Texas Galveston for medical school and then from there to Orlando for residency. And then from Orlando to uh, Punta Gorda, Florida for a couple of years to work. And then uh, I ended up getting uh, recruited back up here because my wife's from St. Louis. So um, Rick Smith recruited me to Blessing Hospital. I've been here ever since. Wow. And then um, so married three kids and uh, your kids are kind of spread out now a little bit or no? Where, where, yeah. what, what general areas? 
Uh, they like okay. Colorado, but White's in Texas doing flight school, and then Cheney's in San Diego, which he loves, um, and then uh, Charlie's in Leadville, okay. which is at 10,000 feet. So every time you go there, you're breathless for a few days. But it's a fun place. Uh, you know, the skiing close by, a lot of hiking, and some great stuff. I like there. how you've crafted your life in a way, put in all the work, mm. played the angles, made the right moves. Because you, you, you pl- I, I feel like you play chess in real life, though, too. I, th- I feel like you carefully move the pieces on the board because my, my wife and I sometimes, we think, we lament how we don't always make all the right decisions. We're like, how, so where is, where's Anthony and Jill now? Yeah. Oh, they're visiting this kid. They're visiting this kid. They're doing this. Yeah. You guys work hard and play hard. Yeah. You guys do all the right things. I think you guys are very good role models. Yeah. I really believe that. Well, I mean, we, we're, you know, we travel a lot. We go a lot of different places. I mean, one downside to that is you don't have that central uh, location for family. I mean, a lot of Quincy families, they have, you know, a lot of strong ties, family ties, and then these massive extended families. And uh, they thrive and live and work in, in a very small area. A lot of them have never been outside the tri-state area, though, I find shocking and surprising. But that's the way they like to live, and they get along well like that, and that's fine. So, you know, it's just a different lifestyle. It's just a different way of doing things. Yeah, but I, mean, I like to get out and see the world because I've gotten out and seen the world. And I think if, if everybody got and saw the world, they'd realize, you know, this is actually kind of fun. It's kind of enjoyable. It's just it's, it's a good way to learn. It's a good way to experience things, and it's a good way to be a more rounded person. I think. Well, I think that the way you said that it was well said i i just want to do both mm-hmm. i just want to do both why can't i have this i mean i've got a nice network in quincy lots of family and friends mm-hmm. but we don't get to travel very much and i think it's it's either because we haven't made it a priority or or maybe it's just our perspective of what we're doing mm-hmm. uh, needs to change so i know that uh in the past you know 10 years that rachel and i have been married we've gone we, we don't generally go on vacation. And I think mm. that's kind of not, it's, that, that's not a good thing for us. So my wife mm. being from Michigan and now she likes to make the joke, but it's not really a joke if you know her. Mm. She didn't really need to get married, didn't really need to get, have kids. Uh, she makes a joke that she doesn't really like kids. But <laughs> it's, I mean, it's not a joke. I mean, yeah. she likes everybody and you know Rachel, she's yeah, so wonderful. sweet and she's an awesome person, but she wants to travel. And I know that, you know, this year we're trying to get out and do a lot more things and you've been very helpful with that and and talking to us about that i think it's it's also your schedule i mean you've got a busy life your your schedule your work structure is different from mine i mean that's the one of the great things about emergency medicine is you work a lot of nights and weekends but you get to work blocks of time and so i can work a week on and take a week off and uh there's not many careers that afford that so most people are nine to five five days a week two days off three weeks a year vacation they just don't get a lot of opportunity to go places. Right. I can technically go somewhere every other week if I wanted to. You know, and so that's, that's one of the, uh, the upsides to it. The other downsides, of course, is you're working when everybody else is, you know, at parties or out to restaurants or whatever it is. But, uh, you know, that's just a trade-off. But the trade-off is you get to go anywhere you want every other week. Exactly. That sounds pretty good to me. Yeah. Um, last question. Mm-hmm. In all of your years of practicing medicine, without naming names, in all of the, your, your experiences in the ER, mm-hmm. what is the most common thing you see in the you know in the ER? Do you have any uh, do you have anything crazy to report? Anything that uh, I mean, I'm, I I wonder. You know, it depends where you practice medicine, right? If sure. you're practicing medicine on the south side of Chicago, south side of Chicago, I don't I, I'm not sure if that's exactly the same as like living in Quincy or not living. At all. No. in other more rural places but uh yeah they call it uh, penetrating trauma or the gun and knife club versus blunt trauma so blunt trauma is like atvs i mean if you're talking from a, just a purely trauma perspective so you've got penetrating trauma and blunt trauma we see a lot of blunt trauma so we see a lot of people in car accidents atv accidents around here is a, is a big problem um and especially when the weather gets nice and people get out and they want to ride around motorcycle accidents are fairly common um so we see a lot of that. And then we, we see a lot of medical type emergencies too. So strokes, heart attacks, um, you know, the general abdominal stuff like appendicitis or ruptured bowel, whatever it is. Um, so, I mean, you're going to see everything here in Quincy. Um, we can't take care of necessarily everything in Quincy and you get, end up getting transferred down to St. Louis, but it's, it's a pretty good hospital system considering how small this town is. 
you know, how much we can take care of it and the specialties we have available to us. So. so it's safe to say you have probably seen it all, but in different proportions depending on seasonality and the general. So are strokes and heart attacks, are those going up in frequency, staying the same, going down? Um, I mean, you know, you could, or it's impossible to tell. It, it's, I mean, the trends are that people are, you know, the trend was that people were living longer. Now people are actually living less long. I think the, the life, <laughs> the lifespan is actually getting less, which is amazing considering, you know, our access to modern medicine that should make us live longer. But in the last 20, 30 years, you've seen a different decline in people's, you know, health habits and eating habits and, you know, there's access to more drugs and alcohol and tobacco, whatever it may be. So, yeah, those diseases aren't ever going to go away. And people have to die of something. And so if you're only living to 75 and the lifespan is only 75, then, I mean, it may rotate out of MIs and into strokes or diverticulitis, whatever it may be for cancer for a while. But then it, there's always that proportion of diseases that's, you know, that's, um, that's getting people, unfortunately. Um, I mean, we can extend life. It's, it's all about health span. So you want to extend your health span, not necessarily your lifespan. And I think that's what people need to adjust their mindset to. It's not the goal is not to live longer, but to live happier, healthier, and then boom, be done with it. What are what are two or three things somebody can do? I lied. That was not the last question. This <laughs> last question. What are two or three things that you see as as a physician, as somebody as active as you? And I know, and on one hand, you're I, I wouldn't say you're biased, but you have a good working knowledge of the human body, mm -hmm. the mind. Um, you've done things yourself. I mean. You know, you've probably had a. I'm, I'm guessing you've had a sip of alcohol in your life. Maybe, may, maybe not. I don't. Yeah, probably. You know, not. probably maybe. I have to think back. You have to think back, yeah. but, you know, what are two or three things that a person can do to live a higher quality of life? And we're not talking, you know, live to be a hundred. Yeah. But just something they can do right away, that can make. Yeah, I mean, them that's that's the amazing thing about it. It doesn't take a physician to figure it out. I mean, it's it's it's. It's got nothing to do with medicine. It's got to do with your basic lifestyle. So number one, if you smoke, you got to stop smoking. I mean, that's probably the biggest thing. Genetics is huge, but you can't do anything about that unless they start coming up with CRISPR technology that can, you know, adjust the uh, gene function, et cetera. But, uh, you know, that diet and exercise, I mean, those three things. So, you know, varieties of exercise and high intensity exercise, weight training is incredibly important as you get older. It's not just about going for a walk. Um, you have to maintain your muscle mass and uh, in turn all those things help with heart and brain health So, you know people want to know what what to do about dementia or memory loss Well, you just got to blow a blood pressure. You've got to control blood sugar. You can control your weight and you've got to uh, Maintain a very active lifestyle and that's what's gonna make all the difference Thank you so much for coming on. Yeah, it's fun. Thank you. Man. You're, you're always fun to talk. We to. didn't talk about Bitcoin though. Oh, you know what? This always <laughs> happens. This always happens. You know, there are so many people that want to talk about Bitcoin and yeah, we don't it's get at 70, to it. It's at 70,000 Is it at 70,000? It hit 70 again. Okay. Well, yeah, it should. Where where's it going to go? Well, I mean, uh, you know, you've got your happening coming up. What's going to happen with that? Um, I think it's going to go up. Uh, how could it not? I think as you get more and more adoption, people realize the value of this new form of currency i think it's going to go to the moon i mean i really do only 15 percent of people yeah have any bitcoin i think that's actually a very high number it maybe it's maybe it's 10 percent. do you know how many people know what it is so hold on a second yeah do you know how many people know what it is you mean just the Anybody. general population? Like you can pull and, and you you can pull 100 people in a big city, 100 people yeah. in Quincy, yeah. 100 people in St. Louis, 100 yeah. people in jo Johannesburg. Yeah. Do you know how many people know what it is? Very few. I would imagine. It's like one out of a thousand. Yeah. Know what it is. And even the people who know, know what it is, who, who think they understand it, don't truly understand it. The only people that really understand it are the people that develop the thing. That doesn't necessarily mean it's a bad thing. It's a nefarious thing. It just requires more understanding. Uh, it's very technologically advanced, and that's why it's so difficult to understand. It is. But you shouldn't avoid it just because you don't understand it. I, I disagree with that maxim. I think, you know, just like any company or business, oh, you should only invest in what you know. Well, if that were the case, you'd never would invest in Apple or Google or the Internet. You know what I'm saying? So I think sometimes you have to take a chance with new technology. And if it feels right, like I think this one does, then I think it's the way to go. Well, we, we have one more minute. And I'll, just, yeah. and I'll just go into this in terms of very lightly in terms of this. When you own a piece of property, mm. do you get mad? 
that you can't buy your Starbucks coffee with the piece of property that you own. No. <laughs> Do you get mad that you don't have gold? When you have a piece of, like when you have a bar of gold, hmm. you have to have something to shave it off with. I hmm. have to have a scale, you have to have a scale, we have right. to have a third party right. person with a scale, we gotta calibrate all the scales before I start shaving gold off. Mm -hmm. I'm not gonna carry it on my back, no. right? So gold, it's like, I understand you know, gold is rallying right now. Yeah. Gold has gone up quite a bit. Gold's sitting around $2,300 a troy ounce yeah. today, I'm pretty it's sure. The, it's the boom of Bitcoin. <laughs> it's the boom of Bitcoin. Everybody go out and buy $1, $1 of Bitcoin. And if it goes to zero, no, I'll, no, one I'll, Bitcoin, I think is what you should buy. Well, you should buy one Bitcoin, <laughs> but that's very difficult. Maybe you can do that. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm not a whole corner yet. Yeah. Hey, thank you. Yeah, man. Good. Appreciate it.